Welcome back. Nearly three weeks on from the quake and many people are still suffering from problems with water and sewerage. It's clear that it's going to take a very long time for the assessors to deal with a large number of claims and as I discovered that's left some residents frustrated. Nearly three weeks on and this Christchurch family is still in limbo. Despite massive damage to their Avonside home, they are still waiting to get any response from the EQC. You know, we lodged a claim with EQC but we haven't had anything back since then. Um, we have followed up with our insurance who said you have to wait for EQC of course. Um, we've gone online to find out kind of where things are in terms of what, what they're what, where the priorities are, where, where they've got meetings and stuff like that. But other than that, there's, I don't know what else we can do. With cracks on the inside of her house and the outside literally falling apart, Peggy had to call in her own civil engineer to check the house was safe to live in. On the other side of town, Chris Vavasor is in a similar position, angry at the EQC for making a stressful situation more difficult. It would just be really nice to get some answers, you know, because we want to be moving on. We, you know, we want to know whether we're supposed to be looking for craftsmen to help us fix the house or a demolition crew and a design and build company because until EQC comes around, we don't know and we can't do anything. Sick of waiting for the EQC, Chris also called in a private structural engineer. It was really stressful watching your house trying to fall down. I mean, if we hadn't got our own structural engineer in, we'd still be living in an unsafe house. These and other Christchurch families are stuck in a cycle that's only making the recovery process harder. We don't know what, what the next steps are. Um, and that's, I guess, a little frustrating in that you're kind of stuck in a limbo because you don't know where and what to do next. Um, I'm, I'm sure they will eventually look after us, but it's it, just that not knowing. And while they admit it's a hard ask, the EQC says they need more time. All I can plead for is patience and continuing to bolster our team, so hopefully we'll start to get through a lot more claims. And judging by the numbers, families like the Loves and Vavasors could be waiting a while. As far as assessments go, you know, we've got 69,000 claims. We've seen 3,500 of them in the last two weeks. Um, gives you an idea of the length of time that it's possibly going to take. So, with blocked phone lines and automated email responses at the EQC's end, it looks like all these residents can do is wait. Gina Gerbic, Metro News. Shortly we will hear from City Councillor Sue Wells about how the council can help these frustrated residents. But first, Marcus Irvine asked her about the new legislation to speed up the recovery process. So last week legislation was passed uh, giving the council more power to speed up uh, in the rebuilding process. Basically an overview of that, what will it involve? What we've done is started a building recovery office here. We want people able to get through the system as quickly and efficiently as possible without compromising building standards or safety. It's important we get repairs done to people's homes, things like chimneys for example, people need to be able to get through that without getting all caught up in red tape. Um, it doesn't mean that the council has a whole suite of undemocratic powers or anything like that. It's aimed at keeping things simple and practical and efficient for people so we can get back on our feet as soon as possible. So has this, uh, the council got the, the staff and the expertise to cope with these new processes? We have and what's more we've asked for help, we've got help, we've got additional people coming in left, right and centre. Um, we've got building consent officers, building consents can actually be processed up and down the country now because it's a standard um, single book so that's quite handy. Uh, heritage professionals we're starting to recruit outside of Christchurch to assist us with that and our staff are coping really well. So speaking of those heritage buildings, uh, there was the decision to call emergency meetings to deal with the future of them. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Well we have to. Um, you've got to start from the point that if it's a building which is agreed by both the building owners, structural engineers and the council's structural engineers as being dangerous, that means it's a hazard to public safety. We can't leave those standing. If we have an aftershock and one of those things falls down and people die, no one's going to be grateful. We have to deal with those as quickly as possible and when we have information that a building is dangerous we need to act on it. That delegation normally rests with our chief executive but we want people to understand what's going on and to be able to see the information we've got and the chief executive would like that delegation exercised 
by the councillors at this table. So we'll be making those calls over the next few weeks. So for the likes of a heritage building that has to be taken down, um, a private developer who owns the land maybe wants to put something in its place, will there be restrictions on what they can put back up in that heritage site? In terms of what goes back up, clear message to anybody who's got a building which adds to the character of the street, even if it's not a listed building, is come and talk to us. We want buildings going back up which enhance the city and don't look like concrete tilt slab monoliths. Um, we're prepared to work with developers to get really good urban design outcomes. We've been hearing uh, a lot of displaced homeowners that are saying they're not getting any word from anyone about what they can do. They don't know whether they should even be living in their house. What is the council able to do or what should the council be doing about these people? For people who are in the position where liquefaction has caused their house to be um, damaged, then they're in just a horrible position at the moment because they are almost in limbo. We're waiting still on information we need to be able to say whether or not the land is stable. Really all I can say at the moment is um, we're doing our best and if people feel like they've fallen through the cracks, come and talk to the council, come and talk to the Building Recovery Office. There are a number of support centres out there too and we want to hear from people who are feeling that way. Thank you very much uh, Sue no for your time. Cheers. No worries. While the effects of the earthquake will continue to dominate the news, we go now to our other stories from around the city. A Christchurch company has released a new iPod application to improve the lives of those confined to electric wheelchairs, as Jonathan Mitchell reports. For people like Matthew Whiting, electric wheelchairs are a necessary part of life, and one Christchurch company is helping make this need even easier. Dynamic Controls, as a member of Apple's Made for iPod program, has connected the iPhone and iPod Touch to a powered wheelchair. And really, it was about taking a, an innovative, innovative approach to wheelchair technology, um, integrating mainstream technology into that. Named the iPortal, it has a range of uses. The iPortal um, application is designed to display essential information about the, the wheelchair. So we have things like um, battery capacity, um, speed indication, compass heading. Um, it also shows information about the seating system. And it's getting a thumbs up from its users. It would allow us to access everyday technology instead of specialised technology. Which isn't surprising as Dynamic Control's product research came directly from those in the know. So it's quite a different market and it's quite um, innovative to actually come to the customer first really engaging directly with, with end users to actually find out what they wanted, what they needed, how, that, how it could function um, for them and then we fed that into the development process which the, the engineers used as a vital piece of information to uh, develop the, the product. The product has the potential to help around half a million people worldwide. Okay. So you're never too old to try an iPod out. No. The application is now available for purchase and it seems age is no barrier. Jonathan Mitchell, Metro News. Coming up after the break, the new game gripping Christchurch youngsters. And a birthday for those who help others. <laughs> 